So, let us begin and continue with quantum field theory two. We are now at section 1.7 on the path integral quantization of quantum field theory. And today we will discuss Feynman rules as derived from the path integral. As I already announced last time, this provides an answer to some comments that I gave in quantum field theory one. And we will see that today, using the path integral formalism, we will be able to derive the Feynman rules in a very, very simple and straightforward way. And the result will be immediately the one that I announced, so the derivation looks actually even simpler than using the operator formalism. So we start from the assumption that we have a quantum field theory for which the Lagrangian path integral is valid, such that we can uh, obtain green functions like this one, where you have a sequence of uh, field operators. These might be different field operators, phi 1, phi n, might be different types of fields, photon field, electron field, and so on, at different space-time points, x1 up to xn. And we have the time-ordered product and the vacuum expectation value of the full vacuum of the theory. And this can be expressed as a path integral. Namely, in the numerator, we have the path integral over all field variables and the integrand is just the classical counterparts of the operator expectation value that we want times the exponential of i times the action. And in the denominator, we have the same thing, but without the operators. This provides a normalization. So that is our starting point. And uh, as a remark again, these objects are called green functions. We didn't directly discuss them in quantum field theory last semester, but in earlier iterations we discussed them a lot, and they are sufficient for all observables. So for example, using the so-called LSZ formalism, you can construct S-matrix elements from such green functions, and you can also construct mass eigenvalues of uh, p-square operators from green functions and so on. So these are sufficient to obtain everything that we want. Now before we derive the Feynman rules, let me give a remark on the time-ordered product, which appears here in the green function. You saw that the path integral is only able to reproduce time-ordered expectation values because naturally when we split up the paths into small time steps, then the operator order automatically emerges to be time-ordered. So uh, the time ordering is uh, necessary uh, on the operator level to obtain agreement with the path integral. And uh, actually, initially, also from the definition of the path integral, the time ordered product is only defined uh, if the arguments are all different. So if you really have a time gap between all the different operators. So for ti unequal to tj for all i and j. So the times must really be different and then the time ordered product is defined and it agrees with the path integral. So what is clear and do you know from experience or you can expect, there will be singularities for equal times. So if two time arguments coincide, then uh, there might be a singularity both on the operator level and in the path integral formalism. And then it's not guaranteed anymore that the left hand side equals the right hand side because the singularities might be different. They may be 
different. So on the operator level, so let's call it T operator, for two operators, the time ordered product schematically would be defined with uh, theta functions. So you would have theta of T1 minus T2 times one order plus uh, or minus, depending on the statistics, T2 minus T1 times the opposite order. That is the definition of time ordering on the operator level. And then you see you have a precise definition at equal times. Namely, there is a singularity, and the singularity is the one from the theta function. It is a well-defined well singularity. And this is the one uh, on the operator level. And there is, at this point, no guarantee that the path integral reproduces the same kind of singularity. Therefore, it may be that the path integral time order ring may be different from this operator time ordering. It's clearly the same for different times, but for equal times, there might be a difference. Okay, that is just a preliminary remark. And now let's discuss the Feynman rules. So, 171. And let us begin with the free theory with no interactions. And let us discuss the propagator in the free theory. Okay. So free theory means that we have an action integral over the Lagrangian density. And uh, in the free theory, I call the Lagrangian L0. 0 stands for free and no interaction. So this is now the same. And what is the form of the free theory Lagrangian? It is always a very uh, specific form. We assume that free theories are the ones that we treated in quantum field theory one where we did the canonical quantization of free fields. So this is a quadratic Lagrangian in the fields. So it must have the following form, schematically written again with real fields. You could also do it for complex fields, but for real fields, let's schematically write one half phi i, phi i times curly d i j times phi j. That is a bilinear expression with some differential operator dij uh, in the Lagrangian differential operator. So all the free Lagrangians that we had had this form. And we quantized a lot of them for real scalar field, complex scalar field, Dirac field, vector field with mass, vector field without mass. All of those three theories uh, had this form. OK, so let us now use this. And uh, the last time we saw that on the path integral level, we need in the Hamiltonian uh, plus i epsilon term, plus i epsilon. So the Hamiltonian was shifted into the imaginary um, uh, part of, of the complex plane. And uh, that can be accounted for already on the Lagrangian level by shifting this differential operator. Um, for example, if we put this dij in the case of a scalar field, it might be minus the d'Alembert operator times Kronecker delta ij minus masses mi square times Kronecker delta ij uh, plus i epsilon times Kronecker delta ij. Then we have shifted the Lagrangian and indirectly also the Hamiltonian by exactly this plus i epsilon term from the last time that we needed here in this path integral. And uh, so the i epsilon is now just absorbed in the differential operator. Now let us define what is called a generating functional. And uh, let us call it Z, Z0. 
zero stands for free, like L zero. This is a generating functional with uh, square brackets and an argument J. Functionals for us here have such square brackets and the arguments are functions and the outcome of such a generating functional is then a number once you specify a certain function J. And it is defined as follows, namely as the path integral over the field configurations times the exponential i times the free action and then plus a term phi i uh, times j i integrated over d4x. Okay. So for every field operator that you have in the theory, you now introduce a source as it is called j i of x, the classical source. In other words, it is a function of x, a classical number valued function of x, and there is such a j of x for each field operator in the theory, for each phi i of x. And the point is that if you now take derivatives with respect to such sources, then it pulls down factors of the field operators in front of the exponential. So by taking lots of derivatives with respect to j, you reproduce such terms that you need in order to uh, evaluate the green function. And so you collect basically all information of all green functions in a single generating functional. And then treating this generating functional combines treating all green functions simultaneously. And uh, now, in the free theory, it is actually possible to directly compute the generating functional exactly. What do we need to do in order to compute the generating functional? We want to integrate the path integral. And in order to do it, we can check what is the nature of the integrand. And the outcome is the integrand is a Gaussian integral because we have an exponential function. And in the exponent, we have something that is quadratic in the fields plus something which is linear in the fields. And that is exactly the form of a Gaussian integral for which we have a direct result. Namely, the result of the Gaussian integral is a normalization factor times the full integrand evaluated at the stationary point. That was simply the rule that we had. And so we can directly evaluate this here in this way. So it's a Gauss, and so what we need is the extremum of the <coughs> integrand, which is one half phi i differential operator dij phi j plus phi i j i. This is the uh, exponent, and we need to find the extremum. So that means we take the functional derivative of this with respect to the field phi, set it to zero, and uh, then we obtain the cream. So what happens? Basically, this is the Lagrangian equation of motion. And we get here differential operator dij phi j plus ji equals 0. That is the, so that is the uh, equation of motion corresponding to the extremum of uh, the exponent. And we always called the field which solves the equation of motion, we called phi star in the current context. So phi star, the extremum value of phi, satisfies this equation. And so we can, of course, solve this. The solution would be phi star, this extremum value of the field, or in other words, the solution of the equation of motion is minus the inverse of the differential operator d to the minus 1 ij applied onto jj. <coughs> that is the solution. And what do we have here? Here we have the inverse of a differential operator. What is the inverse of a differential operator? It is a Green's function. And uh, uh, this is to be read in the sense of convolutions of functions. So this is really a function with two arguments, so let me write it in a more explicit form. Let me write it in more explicit form. The more explicit form would be, uh, what is it? 
uh, phi i star at x would be minus the green function d to the minus 1, which is a function of x and y with indices ij, and we integrate over y times phi j of y d4y. So this is the explicit form of this formula here. And so this is the inverse of the differential operator, which is nothing but a green function. Okay, but uh, then we know what the result is, namely our result of the generating functional set zero of j is now equal to a normalization factor, which is independent of uh, all dynamics because the prefactor is just one half. So we can ignore the normalization factor and then we get e to the minus i over two uh, so plugging in the solution of the equation of motion, an integral d4x d4y ji of x times the green function d to the minus 1 uh, ij of x and y jy uh, jj at y. Okay. So this is the result of the generating functional. And so it contains here a green function uh, of the corresponding differential operator. And that allows us now to read off something very important, namely the free propagator. The free propagator is uh, the value of the lines in Feynman diagrams connecting two points in diagrams. And uh, we gave it a name in quantum field theory one, namely curly P, curly P i j of x and y times i. That was defined as the free vacuum expectation value of the time ordered product of two field operators phi i at x phi j at y. Okay. So this is the definition of the free propagator in operator language and it has this name and now we know what it is. Namely, we obtain it from the general formula on the left by the path integral and that now means that uh, we have to write down the following. In uh, the denominator of the path integral formula we just have nothing but the generating functional evaluated at j equals zero. So from the denominator we get one over c zero evaluated at zero. Okay? Because that is just a path integral with no arguments at all. Then the numerator of the formula is the path integral with two fields in the integrand and two fields in the integrand we obtain them by taking two derivatives with 1 over i square times two functional derivatives, namely one functional derivative with respect to j i at x. That pulls down the factor of phi i of x and another functional derivative with respect to j j at y. That pulls down a factor of phi j of y. And that must be applied onto the generating functional. Then we get exactly the path integral and at the end we set the source is j to zero, then uh, this formula here reproduces exactly the formula that we need in order to evaluate the green function. Okay, but now we have the full uh, evaluated generating functional, therefore we can easily uh, take the derivatives with respect to j. Here there is the generating functional, it is by, uh, has an exponent by linear in j. So if we take two derivatives, we pull down the prefactor of the two j's, which is the d to the minus one. So this result is now exactly 
uh, the one half cancels because of two derivatives. And uh, then the minus cancels against the one over i square. And what remains is one factor of i. So we get one factor of i times d to the minus 1 index ij at x and y. That's it. And that is exactly the rule that we gave in quantum field theory 1, namely the free propagator. In other words, the lines in Feynman diagrams are given by the inverse of the differential operator in the Lagrangian of the free theory. That's exactly the direct outcome of this calculation. P is equal to d to the minus 1. Just to write this down, this is exactly uh, the result given in quantum field theory 1b section 338, where I told you that the derivation of this is not always simple in the canonical framework. It was simple in the example that we looked at at the time, namely QED. There we had the same result, but I told you that in some theories in the operator framework, uh, you do not immediately get this, but in the path integral, as we just saw, we get it immediately for all theories for which we have such a Lagrangian ansatz. Yes? So the calculation, how do we get the, uh, sorry, the expectation value from the other basic ground state? So in the free theory, I call the vacuum uh, like this. In the theory with interactions, I call it omega. But in the free theory, uh, that is the full vacuum of the free theory. Okay, so. But uh, once we switch on interactions, then still in the Feynman diagrams, this is exactly what we need. Uh, whereas uh, the vacuum will change. Okay, so what I want to say is that uh, we have now established this. But we have established it for the time ordered product as it is defined by the path integral. And as I told you, that might differ from the operator time ordering at singular points. And indeed, that is the reason why in the operator framework you sometimes get something different. And the difference is localized at uh, the singularities. OK. So that is the first very important and powerful result. Any other questions? So let us continue with the derivation of Feynman rules. We have now the free propagators. Let us now stay in the free theory for a moment and look at what happens for more complicated expectation values, general green functions in the free theory. And let us just look at an example. That will be sufficient, I think. Let us look at the example of the following. Namely, an expectation value of 4 operators in the free theory, phi 1 up to phi 4. By the way, uh, a side remark, please uh, note that there are two different uh, uh, uses of the term green function. Uh, so in quantum field theory, we generally call such expectation values a green function. You can also call it correlation function. In statistical physics, that would be a correlation function. But in quantum field theory, in particular for the time ordered product, we call all such things green functions. But then there are differential operators, and they also have green functions defined, like you know, from uh, first semester mathematics. So this is a different term, uh, different meaning of the term green function. But of course, there it coincides for this example. So here you have, on the one hand, a quantum field theoretical green function, 
which happens to be equal to a differential operator sense green function. But in general, please note and don't be confused about the two different meanings of the same word. Anyway, let us calculate this expectation value and it is obtained from the path integral in the following way. We again have this path integral formula that you know with a numerator and the denominator. The denominator is just a free functional at z j equals zero. And in the numerator, we now need to pull down four field operators by taking four derivatives with respect to j's. So we have one over i to the fourth power times, that's in abbreviated form, d by dj1 up to d by dj4 uh, applied onto the free generating functional. And after taking the derivatives, we set j equal to zero. Okay, um, good. So what do we, uh, what can we do? Um, very simple. The generating functional is written here. It is an exponential of a bilinear expression in J. So if you imagine evaluating the exponential, you have one plus this plus that thing squared and so on. So you get terms with zero powers of J, two powers of J, four powers of J, six powers of J, eight powers of J and so on by the exponential series which of the terms is necessary if we take the fourth derivative and afterwards we set j to zero. The only term that matters is the one which contains exactly four powers of j. All the other terms drop out. So the ones with less powers than four, you cannot take four derivatives. And the terms with more powers than four, they, uh, if you take four derivatives, there will be some j's remaining. We set j to zero, then they vanish. So this is exactly equal to the fourth derivative of the fourth order term. And so and the normalization factor drops out because of the j, uh, uh, j equals zero term here. So what we get ex is exactly the following, one over i to the fourth times four derivatives applied onto the following, namely one over two factorial from the exponential, then two powers of this minus i over two, let's say integral j d to the minus one j. This is one term and then another term minus i over two integral j d to the minus one j. Okay. That's exactly the result, obviously in some abbreviated form. Now we take four derivatives acting on a term with which contains four powers of j. What is the result? The result is simply the sum of all permutations how the four derivatives can be distributed onto the four powers of j. So how many terms are there? There are four factorial terms, 24 terms. Some of them will be equal, some of them will be different. Let us... Uh, write this down in words. So if we compute this, um, each derivative d by dj must act on to one power of j. Um, therefore, there are four factorial equal 24 combinations. Let us look at one example term first. One example term would be the following. So we have d by dj1, d by dj2, d by dj3, d by dj4, then uh, j d to the minus one j, j d to the minus one j. Okay, and then one term might be the following. So the j4 derivative acts on this j, j3 derivative acts on that, j2 derivative acts on this, and the j1 derivative acts on that. And then there are 23 similar terms with other permutations. Okay. And what is the result of this particular one? The result of this particular one gives you the following, namely here, 
From those two derivatives, we get this different d to the minus one, which is a green function, uh, with the argument uh, x4 and x3. Here, this will be uh, the green function with the argument x1 and x2, and so on. Okay, so let's write it down. So in this particular case, and also using that d to the minus one is p, so we would get p uh, with index three, four, argument three and four in abbreviated form times p one, two with argument one, two. So that is this particular result. Now let's look at uh, all the 24 terms. Among the 24 terms, there are, is first of all, two terms which arise by exchanging three and four. If we exchange three and four, then it just corresponds to flipping the two indices but by construction, the uh, Lagrangian was, of course, symmetric in phi i, phi j, so this is symmetric in the two indices. Therefore, if we swap the indices, we just obtain a factor two. If we swap the indices one and two, we also get a factor of two in the result. And those factors of two, they cancel precisely those one-half factors here. So from these permutations, three, four, and one, two, we just cancel those prefactors one half in front of uh, the Lagrangian. Let's write it down. So exchange three and four, and one and two cancel uh, this one half times j d to the minus one j. So this one half is cancelled. Then we can also exchange uh, the pair three, four, exchanged with the pair one and two. What happens in this case? Then uh, these two derivatives and those two derivatives are swapped. That gives, of course, again the same result. And uh, so this gives also a factor two, and this factor of two cancels the one over two factorial from the exponential function. This two factorial just corresponds to the fact that we had two powers of these uh, blocks here. So by this exchange, we cancel uh, the one over two factorial. So in overall, uh, we have now already eight permutations which just give always the same result and which cancel the factors of one half which naturally appear in the formula. And then there are three different permutations which really give distinct result. So if we exchange the index one and three, then we get different index combinations or if we exchange one and four, then we also get different index combinations. So overall, the 24 permutations give three different results, and each result is multiplied by eight, which cancels the one-halves. So in total, uh, 24 equal eight times three uh, different results. So and the full result is then, if we just write down uh, the final result. The final result is now the following. So all the one over two cancels, and uh, the i over four cancels the two minus one factors, and therefore what remains is the two factors of i. That's all that remains, and then we get the three different terms, namely i times p one two times i times p three four. That is what we already had, plus i times p one three times i times p24 plus i times p14 times i times p23. And that can be symbolized using diagrams. Namely, here we have a line connecting 1 and 2 and a line connecting 3 and 4 plus a line connecting 1 and 3 times a line connecting 2 and 4 plus a line connecting one and four times a line, connecting two and three. 
So this is how it naturally emerges. We get exactly uh, the result that such a green function with many field operators um, is a sum of all possible lines connecting all the points of the green function. And so I think we do not have to uh, do a more general proof. It is quite clear that the same thing will happen if you have an arbitrarily high number of field operators in this expression. Uh, it can always be evaluated in this way. And so I will directly write down the general result. In general, we obtain the following in the free theory. If you have a, such an expectation value, time ordered of n field operators, then you obtain the following. First, there is a case distinction, namely, if you have an odd number of points, then the result is zero. Uh, and uh, because there is no way you can connect an odd number of points by lines such that each point is reached. And from the formula, it's also obvious because the generating functional is this exponential. It contains only an even number of j's. In each term, there is an even number of j's. And here, you would need to take an odd number of derivatives. Afterwards, you set j to 0, so that gives 0. And on the other hand, if n is even, then the same logic applies. And we can write it in words. We get the sum of all um, combinations of lines between the points. And this result is often called Big Theorem. And there is a counterpart of that result also for the operator formalism. So now, that is, of course, still all preliminary. But now we can come to the important part, namely the theory with interactions, and see what the path integral can tell us about this. So let us now assume that we have a theory, again defined by a Lagrangian L, which is a sum of a free theory L0 plus an interaction Lagrangian. And the free theory is bilinear as before. And the interaction theory is any uh, other local Lagrangian, which depends on the fields of the theory and uh, potentially also the derivatives of the fields. Then, what is the essence of perturbation theory in the path integral? Actually, perturbation theory in the path integral is extremely elegant and simple. What you simply have to look at is the exponent in the integrand of the path integral, which is, of course, this. What can we now do? We can simply write uh, the Lagrangian as the sum of the free Lagrangian plus the interaction Lagrangian. And in the path integral, everything is number valued. Therefore, we can write this as e to the i times the free Lagrangian times the exponential of the interaction Lagrangian. That's simply true, because this is a number. And now we can simply expand this in powers of the interaction. That's all. So we can expand this up to a desired order in the interaction. And then you obtain a path integral formula for, let's say, the nth order interaction term of your green functions. That's all. 
once you have expanded this, let us imagine you have expanded, then how does this look like if you think of the path integral? Then this generates the path integral of the free theory that we have just discussed. And this is a prefactor of uh, the exponent of the free theory, which contains some operators. So what this generates at any finite order of the interaction Lagrangian is green functions like this. And we already know how to calculate them. So this generates the path integral of the free theory. And therefore, we can write this in a very simple way. We can immediately obtain a formula for the full result, namely for the time-ordered expectation value in the full vacuum of the interacting theory. So let's say phi 1 up to phi n vacuum expectation value. And our path integral formula is now the following namely uh, up to this normalization factor, which appears in the denominator, we um, have to do the following. Namely, we integrate over uh, all the field variables. Then we have here uh, the fields phi 1 up to phi n, the classical field uh, functions, which are integrated over. And then we have let's say this here, 1 plus i times the integral of the interaction Lagrangian plus 1 half i times interaction Lagrangian square plus and so on. This comes from the expansion of the interaction and then i to the e to the i integral over L0. That is now our perturbative expression for the full green function. And here you can expand up to any desired order in the interaction. And then each term, as I said before, looks like one of the terms that we have already computed. Therefore, we can write it in the way as we have uh, obtained before, namely, uh, this is now obtainable from the generating functional of the free theory. And in, th in this way, the field operators here would be replaced by derivatives with respect to the sources j. So we can write this as a derivative with respect to j1 up to jn of the generating functional in the free theory. And also here, there are some field operators. And we can also obtain them from the generating functional by also taking the functional derivatives with respect to j for any phi which stands here inside of these Lagrangians. So therefore, let me uh, put here maybe an argument, or uh, let's do it in the next line. So we have a normalization factor times the following. For each derivative, we have a factor 1 over i, 1 over i to the n times functional derivative with respect to j1 up to functional derivative with respect to jn then 1 plus i times the integral of the interaction Lagrangian, where we now need to do the following, namely each phi i is replaced by 1 over i times the functional derivative with respect to j i plus higher orders. Okay. So then we always pull down the appropriate operator by taking the functional derivative. And then we just apply this onto the free generating functional. And afterwards, we set all the sources to 0. And then we have an explicit formula for our green function in the full theory obtained from functional derivatives of the free generating functional. So this is really a totally explicit formula uh, which is perturbative and which gives you the desired green function. And that is the starting point to read off Feynman rules in the interacting theory. And from here, we can immediately read off the usual Feynman rules. 
Basically, since you already know how Feynman rules look like, what remains only is to check that the usual rules are really the ones which emerge from this formula, and they do. So let's write down let's write down a small list of items. So what emerges from this formula here is uh, comparing to the previous case where we have said how to, in general, calculate free vacuum expectation values. So each term here corresponds to something like this. So each term uh, here is an application of many functional derivatives onto z0. And each such term is given by uh, uh, all possible lines connecting all the possible points defined by the functional derivatives. So therefore, what we get is uh, the following. We get external points, namely for each of these external functional derivatives corresponding to those explicit field operators, there will be one point, and at each such point, there must be lines which end uh, or begin at those points, so external points, one to n. Then there are internal points, also called vertices, for each factor of i times the interaction Lagrangian. So this defines a space-time point uh, on which the functional derivatives act. Then there are vertex Feynman rules. So what happens is that if you have here in the interaction Lagrangian a product of some field operators, then it means that for each such field operator at the same point, a line must end. So you get these typical vertex Feynman rules. And the vertex Feynman rules are associated with a number. And the number comes from i times the prefactor of the fields in the interaction Lagrangian. And that is exactly the rule that we always had. So the vertex rules, uh, as usual, correspond to prefactors in i times l int. And then the rule is we have lines connecting all internal and external points. And uh, there are combinatorical factors, how many lines, how many uh, factors of one half cancel, and so on. And those rules are exactly the same ones as in the operator formalism. So there is no need to discuss them in any detail. So let me give you the references. So in quantum field theory 1A, where we discussed the Feynman rules very extensively, this was section 2. In quantum field theory 1B, where we discussed the Feynman rules a little bit more briefly, that was section 3. Let us, however, highlight the differences to the operator approach. So the difference, one difference, is that you immediately see we get the interaction Lagrangian, and we do not get the interaction Hamiltonian because we have started from a Lagrangian path integral, and so there was never a Hamiltonian to begin with, we immediately get i times l int instead of minus i times the interaction Hamiltonian. 
In the operator formalism, we directly obtained minus i times the interaction Hamiltonian, and then we said very often that is equal to plus i times the interaction Lagrangian, but it's not always equal. In the path integral, we always get immediately the interaction Lagrangian. Then the result uh, is, of course, the one uh, corresponding to this path integral definition of time ordering, which might be different from the operator one at singular points. Um, and uh, then, for example, in case of uh, interactions where we have derivatives of the fields that appears in some theories, for example, gauge theories sometimes have derivative interactions. So what happens in the case of such derivatives? Um, here, uh, the derivatives can simply be pulled out of the path integral. What we simply obtain is if you have here in L int, you have a derivative, then uh, literally what is written here is the derivative uh, so that would give you derivative d mu acting then on some functional derivative with respect to some source j of x, uh, which ultimately acts onto the generating functional. Okay, so this is what literally comes out of the calculation. And therefore, this uh, would be the same as if you have the derivative uh, and Looking at this expression, that expression would be like the expectation value corresponding uh, to that particular operator, right? So without that derivative, that would correspond to such an expectation value, and then at the end you take the derivative. That is what comes out naturally from the path integral. So such an interaction in the Lagrangian ends up uh, with effectively such an expression. Now, if this is Lorentz covariant, then the derivative acts onto a Lorentz covariant object and obta you obtain a Lorentz covariant result. What happens in the operator approach, however? In the operator approach, you would obtain this thing here, the operator time ordered product, and then in the expectation value, you have L int. That means you would need to take this here in the expectation value, and then this might not be the same as pulling out the derivative out of the time ordering, because time derivatives do not commute with the time uh, ordering operator in the operator approach because of the theta functions. So this is maybe not equal to this thing. And then it can happen that in the operator formalism, such an expectation value is actually not Lorentz covariant because the uh, time derivative here gives an extra term from the derivatives of the theta functions. And so you see here that in the path integral approach, the treatment of derivative interactions immediately leads to something Lorentz covariant, whereas in the operator approach, derivative interactions at first might give rise to some non-Lorentz covariant terms, which then have to cancel against the non-Lorentz covariant stuff in the, in the interaction Hamiltonian, which we have seen the last time. So that is exactly the kind of cancellation of problems that I alluded to already in the last semester. And uh, so first of all, am I, so this, this is the full comment. So let me, let me maybe, clean the blackboard and write a few uh, nice sentences at the end and then continue with the comments. So the main point is that all the rules are as given in our quantum field theory lecture last semester section Three, three, eight. At that point, I told you that the derivation is not always straightforward, and here we have now given a completely general 
derivation, which covers the cases where the operator approach fails. And this is now my final comment. So this holds in particular if the following things exist. So first of all, for derivative interactions, uh, it holds. And so in the operator approach, we would have the interaction Hamiltonian is not equal to minus the interaction Lagrangian. And as we have just seen, such a operator time ordered product of something like this. So in particular, if you look at the details, then this object in particular, where you have two operators and you take the derivatives of both, then this is not covariant. Okay. And then there is a cancellation between the non-covariant terms in the Hamiltonian and from such expectation values. And uh, lo and behold, the result in the operator approach then uh, after this cancellation simply reduces to the path integral result where the non-covariant terms are not existing and where you immediately are allowed to take the interaction Lagrangian. Similarly, uh, our derivation also holds in the case of massive vector fields where uh, similar problems happen, namely also there the interaction Hamiltonian is not equal to minus the interaction Lagrangian as we reiterated last week. And here also, we didn't do it in the lecture, but if you would take the effort of deriving in the operator framework uh, that expectation value from the operators that we have constructed in quantum field theory one. So they are completely explicitly given. So you can explicitly evaluate this object. It looks Lorentz covariant with the two indices mu nu, but the result is not Lorentz covariant because the A0 field had a constraint and it was eliminated by using its equation of motion and therefore it behaves in a way which provides a non-Lorentz covariant answer to this expectation value. So also this is also uh, not Lorentz covariant. And again, the two problems cancel out. And the path integral provides you in both cases immediately with a manifestly Lorentz invariant expression of Feynman rules. And those are the correct rules that we can use. And as we have stated the last time, there is a wide class of quantum field theories for which the path integral in the Lagrangian form is valid. That includes the massive vector boson, it includes the massless vector boson, it includes derivative interactions and so on. And so for all of those quantum field theories, the path integral Feynman rules are now established. That is a first main result of today's lecture. Any questions to this? Yep. Okay, um, for them, of course, the Feynman rules might be non-Lorentz covariant uh, as well, since you start out with a non-Lorentz covariant or invariant theory, which is then obviously all right. And so, of course, such theories might be interesting for their own reasons. And uh, then the Feynman rules have a more general form. So it might still be true uh, that the theories can be described by a Lagrangian path integral. Um, because uh, that is not necessarily restricted to Lorentz invariant theories, of course. And then the derivation of the Feynman rules would work along the same lines, but the outcome might be non-Lorentz invariant if the interaction uh, violates Lorentz invariance, or maybe you are just interested in a rotationally invariant theory in uh, non-relativistic settings. That is perfectly all right. Also, if you have non-local Lagrangians, uh, then still you might be able to derive Feynman rules in the same way, but then the vertices might not be point-like delta functions in position space, but they might correspond to integrals, like form factor integrals, and then in momentum space, you would also have momentum space integrals at each vertex that can exist and is possible. And then even more general theories, like we also said yesterday, could uh, be of a form where the Lagrangian path integral 
to begin with is not correct because there are additional factors in the path integral coming from the transition from Hamiltonian to Lagrangian picture like this functional determinant can appear as a prefactor and so then uh, that would also give rise to maybe additional Feynman rules or maybe it is even impossible to express that functional determinant as a set of Feynman rules. So this would depend on the cases. So this topic is now over and we will continue with something different. The Feynman rules are fully established and uh, so we have achieved this goal which we wanted to achieve. And since I assume that you already know how Feynman rules work, there is nothing else I want to say about Feynman rules. Therefore, if you have any other questions, let me know. Good. So, a new topic, but still path integrals. Namely, let us look at path integral relations. In other words, let us look at how you can really use the path integral to obtain non-trivial and far-reaching interesting information on quantum field theoretical properties. And one of them, which I want to highlight in particular, is the so-called quantum action principle. Which in a sense is a summary of many such relations. So what we assume is the same conditions as before. So section 1.5 up to section 1.7. So we have a Lagrangian quantum field theory and the Lagrangian path integral is valid. Then let me begin with a few remarks on the definition of the path integral. We have already alluded to this. The path integral is an integral and uh, it is defined via a limiting procedure. And uh, we have not been very explicit in what the limiting procedure actually is, but we have only provided some examples. So time steps, uh, let's say one divided by n time steps and then you take n to infinity. That is one uh, definition of the path integral measure in a constructive way. But uh, at the moment we do not have a proof of whether uh, the result is independent of how you split up the time steps or whether there is actually convergence and so on. So a precise definition of the measure Uh, has not yet been given, but uh, you already know from quantum field theory one that anyway there are divergences in quantum field theory which need so-called regularization and renormalization treatment. And that is basically the point of defining the path integral measure. So the full definition of the path integral measure would amount to defining such a regularization and renormalization procedure to really be able to take the full limit to a finite quantum field theory. So in other words, a precise definition of the method measure contains the procedure of regularization and renormalization. for which many different detailed prescriptions are possible. And so therefore, if we go back to the path integral, then the properties of the path integral measure are a reflection of the choice of our regularization and renormalization procedure. So the precise properties of the path integral measure uh, depend on the regularization and renormalization procedure. Good. 
having said that, we will now assume something. Namely, we will assume a certain property of the path integral measure, which is the obvious one, and uh, then discuss whether it can actually be realized. So we discuss two points in this section, and the first direction is we assume that the path integral measure d phi is invariant under uh, variable transformations, so the usual thing, we do a integration variable transformation, and uh, the integral remains the same. Okay? So we assume the path integral measure is invariant, and then from that assumption, we will take interesting consequences. Those interesting consequences will then automatically hold in all cases where the assumption is true. The second direction is we will provide one constructive example where the assumption is true. Namely, we will provide one particular uh, case of a regularization renormalization procedure, namely so-called dimensional regularization. And in this case, uh, that is really true, and therefore all our derived consequences are valid in this dimensional regularization. So here we will give an explicit proof of one, which is in that context called the regularized quantum action principle. So it has been proved under this name in the literature. So this is what we discuss, so two directions. And uh, before going there, actually maybe let me provide you with uh, two examples of what it will lead to. And so this uh, then also corresponds to your exercise. By the way, the exercise sheet is on the Opal page. So you can download it from Opal, and uh, the exercise refers to what I tell you in the lecture, and that is what I will tell you now. So here are two examples. Example of a so-called Dyson-Schwinger equation in QED. So in QED, we have the following equation, we will derive it, or you will derive it in the exercise, uh, which is the following. Uh, was it? Yeah. So here, in QED, you take all Feynman diagrams with two external photons the so-called photon propagator or photon self-energy. So three level plus all uh, loop Feynman diagrams with two external photons. And that is equal to the following, namely, here you have a three level photon propagator line. And here you have a three level electron photon vertex from QED, then two electron lines, and here you have again all diagrams where the two electron lines merge to a photon. That is a Dyson-Schwinger equation. One simple example of a so-called Dyson-Schwinger equation, and what is the nature of this equation? It is an equation between uh, infinite sets of Feynman diagrams or an identity between so-called green functions. So that would be a green function, a set of infinitely many diagrams with two external photons. So it's a two-photon green function. And this building block here is a green function for photon, electron, electron. So it's a three-point green function. And the identity tells you that if you take this green function here, you attach to it a three-level building block, you integrate over the momentum of this electron line, then you obtain that green function here. 
So it's a, in principle a non-perturbative identity between different types of green functions and uh, so you can evaluate this in uh, different ways. You can use it for example to build up perturbation theory because you see that here uh, if you would know this at tree level, if you would know this green function at tree level, then here you already have a one loop diagram and then it tells you the one loop result for this is obtained from the tree level result of this green function. So iteratively in this way by combining this with other identities, you can step by step build up perturbation theory uh, from such Dyson-Schwinger equations. And that is also done in some textbooks. On the other hand, you can also use it non-perturbatively by simply saying, okay, I have here an identity between two different green functions and maybe there are more identities and you can try to numerically, for example, numerically solve the identities by plugging in an ansatz, numerical ansatz for this green function, then it will give you numerical result for the other green function. If you have sufficiently many identities such that all the ansatzes are constrained, then you can get a non-perturbative solution to all green functions in your quantum field theory. So this can also give rise to powerful numerical approximations to non-perturbative results. For example, in QCD, this is done in order to investigate confinement of QCD by investigating such uh, exact properties of green functions. So this is a Dyson-Schwinger equation which follows uh, in this way. Let me give you a second example. What identity? in QED. So the what identity I wanted to tell you is the following. Namely, if you take again the same green function all diagrams for the photon self-energy which depends on Lorentz indices mu nu and which depends on a momentum P which flows through the diagram now let us contract this with p mu. You contract this green function with the external momentum p mu, then the water identity tells you that the result is exactly the same as that one, where you simply take the tree level photon propagator. So in other words, all the higher order contributions to the photon propagator they vanish if you contract them with p mu. So that is the maybe more interesting thing. And the higher order diagrams, we call them sigma, the self energy of the photon in quantum field theory one. That vanishes. Okay, so that is the equivalent statement. And that is a statement that we already made in quantum field theory one and we used it, but we didn't fully prove it. And so it will be proved here in, in this section uh, as a void identity. So these are two kinds of identities which you can derive in very simple ways from the path integral. And they follow if the path integral measure is invariant under variable transformations. Good. So, okay, so we have still a little bit of time. So, therefore, we can begin with uh, this. And so, in the exercise sheet basically contains uh, proof both of these identities and uh, similar ones um, in an extended form. All right, where were we? Uh, I think I skipped one point. Yeah, here. Okay, right. So section 181, let's first discuss and define what we mean by an invariant measure in the path integral. So let us look at a field transformation. Let phi i of x go to phi i of x plus delta phi i of x, which is an infinitesimal field transformation 
and uh, what we require here is that this uh, infinitesimal variation of the field uh, has a few properties. First of all, it should be local. So it uh, should only depend on other fields at the same space-time point x. It might be nonlinear. In other words, it could contain products of uh, other field operators. So it's a possibly nonlinear combination of all fields of the theory. In the operator language, this would be called a composite operator. So we allow field transformations into such composite operators. Then, next, uh, assume that under this field variation, the Lagrangian goes into itself plus a variation, delta L, as a result. And now, the path integral relationship should be the following. Let us look at the path integral. Path integral di of x. Uh, let me assume here any functional of all the fields of the theory, just as an abbreviation of all these expressions that we had before, times e to the i times the action. Then as a first step, we could rename the variables. Let's rename the variables. Let's say then we would have the new fields phi prime of x functional f of phi prime e to the i times the Lagrangian L prime with the primed fields. Okay, so this is just a relabeling. But now let us plug in for phi prime the transformation. Phi prime is now phi plus delta phi and see what is the result. And now the assumption of an invariant measure is that the measure d phi prime is the same as the measure b phi without prime. That is the assumption. And so when we say it is the measure invariant, then we mean the following statement, namely this integral is the same as just replacing d phi prime by d phi without prime, but leave the rest untouched. That is the meaning of an invariant measure. And so then we would have here f of phi plus delta phi and here e to the i times l plus delta l. Okay. That is the equality which corresponds to the measure being invariant under this field transformation. So the decisive equation is this one. And uh, this intermediate step is just for you to memorize how you can motivate this equation. But this is the equation that we will assume corresponding to the measure being invariant. And from this relationship, we can deduce all such identities. And uh, at the same time, this is the relationship which we will be able to prove in the context of dimensional regularization. Yes? Is this the same assumption as when uh, as we will assume that the theory is anomaly free? Uh, no. That is not the same as, uh, ah, okay, um, uh, um, okay. In, in a way, yes, in a way, yes. So uh, in the context of anomalies, yes, uh, you can view it like this, plus uh, the assumption that the Lagrangian is invariant. So you would uh, start with a symmetry transformation. Yeah. And uh, then you would say, okay, I have a symmetry of the Lagrangian or of the action. The action stays invariant. And uh, if also the measure is invariant at the same time, then uh, your symmetry is a true symmetry of the quantum theory. Uh, that's exactly right. That is a, a very nice way of uh, looking at anomalies uh, from Fujikawa, uh, and uh, indeed, you are absolutely right. It is just uh, the point that, for example, in dimensional regularization, the measure is always invariant. So this is just a side remark for you, or as a pre, uh, let's say, preliminary uh, remark on how it is all connected. Uh, so maybe others do not know what anomalies are. Anomalies are symmetry breakings by quantum effects. And in this setup, in the path integral, uh, you could say, I have a classical symmetry. L is invariant under a transformation. But the measure is not invariant. 
And then you see the symmetry is not broken by the Lagrangian, but the symmetry is broken by the measure, therefore by quantum effects. Very nice way of looking at anomalies, symmetry breakings by quantum effects. Okay, but in dimensional regularization, the measure is always invariant. We will prove that. So this relation is always fulfilled. But then the point is, uh, anomalies are a physical phenomenon. They do not depend on the chosen regularization. In dimensional regularization, if you have an anomaly, it means that you cannot have an invariant Lagrangian in d dimensions. You might have an invariant Lagrangian in four dimensions, but you cannot uh, expand it to a d-dimensional invariant Lagrangian, and then the symmetry is also broken by quantum effects, but the breaking is manifested in the, uh, let's say, d-dimensional breaking of the Lagrangian. But, uh, okay, your remark is valid and it's correct. But anyway, this is what we would mean by uh, the statement, the measure is invariant, and uh, sometimes it is, and as your remark uh, clearly shows, this is not always true. For example, in this Fujikawa uh, discussion of anomalies, the measure would be not invariant, and that corresponds then to a different type of regularization, renormalization procedure, which allows to discuss anomalies from a different point of view. The physics result is the same, but the point of view is different. Very nice point of view. Okay, but this is the statement. Um, so this is the meaning of invariant measure. And indeed, now let us assume this to hold. And we have just given all the relevant remarks uh, that lie behind this innocent looking statement, assuming this to hold. Do we have more time? No. Okay, so this is actually not a bad point to stop. We have motivated our discussion by providing two interesting looking all order identities, which we can easily prove from this. And uh, the proof will be maybe already, let's say, indicated a little bit in the afternoon in the exercise and then also expanded on next week. Okay, so see you in the afternoon.